So again, uh, schedule-wise, uh, we're about to start uh, user experience pitfalls, and then we have uh, two more speakers after that. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to roll right into it. Uh, Ash Banizek is from Omaha, Nebraska. Ash is a passionate and outspoken UX advocate from the Union Pacific Railroad with nearly a decade of experience in the field. She loves to discuss UX and get folks to that aha moment about the importance of psychology and tech. Uh, outside of UX, Ash is an award-winning Toastmaster and uses her public speaking experience to infuse humor and thought-provoking questions at her talks. You can follow her on Twitter or at LinkedIn. Uh, today, Ash is going to present user experience pitfalls. User experience is becoming a business necessity, but you don't know where to begin and your stakeholders just aren't on board. Uh, this talk introduces the basics of UX design and some ways to get the discussion started with your stakeholders. Ash, if you'd like to share your screen, uh, we're excited to have you. All right. There we go, the magic of technology. Hi, I'm Ash, as, as he said. I am very thrilled to be talking to Techlahoma today. One of my favorite things, whenever I hear about pitfalls, I automatically think of the Activision game. So this is just some free advertising Activision. I do not work for them, but if you want to check out a game that's older than me, give it a give it a whirl. As I said, I'm Ash. I've been in the user experience industry for about a decade. I love mixing psychology and technology, and it is my passion. Um, to research and design products that people love. I generally don't do this, but I just wanna say with COVID-19, things are really weird right now. And I know a lot of people need uh, some extra support. They're not uh, meeting up with their friends. They're not doing their normal activities. Some people are out of work. I'm actually furloughed this week. I go back to work next week. And so I just wanna make sure that everybody is well aware of your resources. Um, if you're having any sort of painful thoughts or suicidal thoughts, uh, just need some help, you can reach out to the Trevor Project, that's particularly for LGBTQ, or the Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. All right, well, that's not what my talk's about, but I just wanna let you know, if you are having trouble out there right now, there are people that can help you and stay and hang in there. All right, so what are we gonna talk about today? Well, we're gonna first do a level set. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what users are, what use UX is, things like that. Then I'm gonna take you through some basic technique overviews, quick ways to inject user experience in your project, just a few different things that you can consider trying. And then we're gonna get into the pitfalls themselves. There are seven of them, we'll go through all seven, and I'll even give you some ideas and solutions using those techniques we talked to previously. All right, let's dig in. We're going to start with some terminology. The first thing is users. So who are our users? What I like to do generally when I'm in a classroom setting or in a, on stage, I like to talk to my audience a lot. So what I'm going to ask for you all to do is you'll be chatting in that, that uh, chat box there and just shout some things out. And Max will kind of shout them out at me as we go through and we'll just kind of have a little bit of dialogue. So when you're thinking about the actual software that you are designing, who are you designing it for? Who's gonna be using it day in day out? Shout at me. To dive in, definitely just chime into all the different chat boxes into Twitch and or Slack and I'll shout them out. Modelers. No, sorry, I keep looking over here because I have a client big screen admin. over here. Modelers, client admins, all right, who else? All, all the people, people that use the product, that's true. <laughs> um, but when you say all the people, you generally need to be more specific because if we could design for everyone, we're really designing for no one. Customers, blue collar pipeline workers. So people are kind of shouting stuff out, developers, potential and current customers. So we're getting a lot of mix. So the bottom line with, these users are oftentimes, they aren't us. They vary widely depending on what we are creating. But they're, the main point here are those are the people that are actually gonna be using your product day in and day out. The next question, what is usability? 
What does that mean? Anybody shout out a definition? I will laugh if the, the Wikipedia link just pops up here, but <laughs> can anybody shout out? What does usability mean to you? End users, the unclean. Uh, thank you, Fish Breath 49. <laughs> The ability to easily do what I want to do. Being easy to use, better needs, providing adequate affordances. Awesome. So yeah, usability, we talk about the different principles of usability. But when we talk about the different principles, we're talking about a lot of different things. One of the things we're talking about is the effectiveness of the application. A lot of people get effectiveness and efficiency confused. They're both usability principles, but effectiveness essentially is saying, how well you're doing something as it applies to the problem. How well does it solve that problem? Whereas efficiency is how quickly you can do something without waste. So when I like to explain the difference between effectiveness and efficiency because people really focus on efficiency. I'd like to tell them, zoom out. Let's say you're on a rowboat. You're rowing down the river and it starts to leak. Now, you have a couple options, but you decide that you're gonna make the most efficient water bailing process that you can, right? And you eliminated all waste. You are getting that water out of the boat. But it might be more effective to patch the hole, right? So then you're not even bailing out water in the first place. So when I talk about effectiveness and efficiency, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, and I know a lot of people lean on efficiency, but you got to look at that effectiveness too. So there's that efficiency component. Next thing, it's learnability. It's a little bit of a made up word. I think it's a real word now. Usability folks like myself have been saying it for long enough that I think we're now in the dictionary. But what does learnability mean? Type it in. <laughs> All right, Max, sorry about that. So whatever minimize support, support calls for help, usefulness. Ability to grasp new concepts, how long it takes the user to figure something out, the learning curve, exactly. So when people start using your product, how long it takes them to learn and to understand, and also if they can incrementally learn and understand how to use the product as they get more and more familiar with it. Great products will not only give a good introduction to the user, but as they get more proficient with the product, we'll start teaching them those quick tips like, uh, hotkeys on the keyboard or other various things that you might not want to overwhelm a new uh, user with. The next thing we talk about is safety. Now, this is the one that really throws people for a loop. They're like, safety, do you mean that my computer won't turn into a toaster and zap me? Well, that is part of safety, yes, but there are also other parts of safety. Can anybody else shout out what we might be talking about when we're talking about safety of software and users being on that software? Thank you for putting out the Wikipedia link. <laughs> All right, so we've got a lot of security people talking, <laughs> encryption, data protection, uh, not deleting form entries if you mistype something, making it hard to do the wrong thing, very good privacy. So yeah, safety is about letting the user be able to undo, uh, letting the user know that they're gonna be making a critical action, letting the user know where they are in the application, how they can get back, also knowing that their application uh, data is safe. It's all of that stuff. So when we're talking about safety, we really are talking about you know, how dangerous it is. If I click this button, did I just order a rail car full of coal that is now being delivered to my address? Or is there a few more steps in that process, right? I use rail car because I work for the railroad. Next, we have memorability. So what does it mean to be memorable in a software application? I like a Kendall Corner said, it's impossible to get my apps into a broken state. So very safe apps. All right, memorability is it's intuitive. The UI is the same each time I return to it, leaving an impression. The examples I like to give with memorability are think of your tax software, for example. In the United States, we have to do our own taxes because you know the rest of the world, they tell them how much they need to pay. The United States, they have to give us a quiz every year, make us guess the right amount we need to pay in our taxes. So 
if you look at applications that try to help us with that, Intuit, TurboTax, h and Block, they need to have high memorability and high learnability because how often do you really do that? About once a year. Um, so when I talk about memorability, it's you know if you've taken a break from the application, whether you went on a two vac week vacation or you only use this software quarterly for whatever reason, how easy is it for you to jump back into the product and to say, yeah, I know what I'm doing without having to call over your supervisor or call over you know, Jane from next door or consult your, your manual to figure out how it works. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is satisfaction. And this one is just kind of simple. It's how much a, a person, a user enjoys to use your software, how much, well it fills that need for them. Even though I don't enjoy using my tax software, I am satisfied with it. I'm just not satisfied with their lobbyists. All right, given a lot of, <laughs> given a lot of flack to the tax folks, so I do apologize. All right, so what is user experience? A lot of people get usability and user experience confused. So we're gonna talk about that in just a sec, but what is the difference for you? What is user experience? <laughs> Thank you, Phil, they deserve it. <laughs> All right, you guys are cracking me up today. I appreciate that. All right, it's pretty quiet how angry they get from using your software. I like that, I like that. <laughs> All the previous things combined, that is, that's good there. How your app feels as a thing they are interacting with, what they think and feel while using the software, how the application makes the user feel. So I hear that, that feeling, that feeling, it's that cohesiveness, and that's right. So we've got the usability and it's looking at things from very select principles. But with user experience, once again, we're kind of zooming out and we're saying, okay, what's that entire experience look like? Um, this has been quoted, I don't know how many different folks have said that this is the first person I heard it from. So I have this quote from Casey Bax, usability is the saddle and the stirrups, user experience is how it feels to be on the horse. So you can design a great saddle, you can design great stirrups, but until you actually put it with the entire experience of your application, my application is, is horseback riding in this case, it, you don't have a good user experience yet, right? So let's start with user goals and business goals. And first thing I'm gonna ask you is, whenever you're designing a piece of software, if you do not know what either of these goals are, that's gonna be problematic. What might be a business goal of your current software? So think about something that you're designing right now. What is the business's goal? And don't say to make money because yes, every business's goal is to make money. That's how we stay employed, but there's more to it than that. There's something that we want them to do. Uh, so what is it? Sell, okay, to reach their mission. Reach a specific audience to increase contact with clients, continue using the software, continue using the software, why? So we're just gonna kind of be digging into the why, why, why. We do, we call this the seven whys. Make those dollars, yes, we talk about that. Meet their specific needs. So generally with, with business goals, so for example, if I am designing an application that allows my conductors and engineers that are driving the train, my business goal, is with this application, I want them to be able to mark when they've dropped off a rail car, okay? And the business goal behind that is I wanna have more accurate reporting. And why do I wanna have more accurate reporting? Because I wanna make sure that my customers are informed when something happens, um, that they're gonna get that, that rail car in place. And also I wanna know when I need to start the clock on reclaiming that rail car, um, I want to know how efficient my crews are. There's a bunch of different business goals with this one thing that's just letting the, the crews mark, yep, I delivered it here. So what about our user goals? Our goal as a business is to make money, to get the user to do a certain thing or give us a certain thing. What is the user trying to do? <laughs> Value add. Oh, you guys are cracking me up. So what is the user trying to do? 
ride a train, okay. Uh, and the conductor and engineers say they're yeah they they want to get their their job done <laughs> to have fun. Yes, uh, they, it could be if you're in an application such as a game or a social media network, maybe that is your goal to have fun, be productive. So let's talk about you know with the uh, the Union Pacific Railroad customers, they want to know when their product is going to be there. So the, they're going to be using the data from that application to be able to plan, okay, when do I need to get my shift workers there to unload that car? How long do I have to release it? When can I expect these products? So I know to tell my end consumers that if we get this raw material here, we'll have it out the door in three days, that sort of stuff, to file a complaint. <laughs> yes, it absolutely, if it's a, if you're creating a complaint filing system, that is, that is the user goal because they want their complaint generally resolved. So not necessarily thinking about it in task space because yes they are trying to file a complaint like fish breath 49 said i love these names by the way but what is the purpose of filing that complaint now sometimes it's just to be a karen right but most of the time it's because you want to get something resolved you have a problem that you need fixed etc cetera, etc cetera. okay so what we're trying to do in ux is we're trying to get those business goals and those user goals to overlap and where they overlap, that's where we're going to find the return on investment for the company and the return on experience for the user. Because if your application does not meet their needs, it doesn't give them a good return on experience, they're going to stop using your application, right? So that's that value. Now, there's a missing piece that a former presenter I also work with, Matt Steele, uh, he always likes to poke this with me, technical feasibility. Very important, right? You need to find that overlap too. Otherwise, if it's insanely ins expensive to do, it could be great for business goals and user goals, but may not be completely technically feasible. So we need to look at all that overlap to find really that sweet spot where we can make money, make people happy, and actually get the thing coded. All right, you don't get ROI. Yes, we do, we do want to get return on investment. You do get ROI. Um, talk about that in questions. So good UX is built around users. So uh, user research is primarily what uh, I do, and that's kind of the front end of my job. Before I start designing anything, I start doing some research. So what I'm trying to do is figure out who our users are, what they're trying to accomplish with our application, what constraints are they working in, those could be cultural constraints, things like our users are extremely private and they won't give you data in this way, or um, our users are part, part of a union and we have very strict structural policies around how we behave with the union. It could be environment. Our users are using this application with gloves and you need to realize that they're not going to be able to use all this touch functionality that you've designed. Uh, or skill level. Our, our users are they don't own smartphones. They don't own personal computing devices. We need to assume that their base level of technical knowledge is low, or we can assume that it's high. I mean, so we need to figure out all these different constraints so that we know who we're actually building for. Otherwise, we'll just build for ourselves. They are current process. So how are they currently getting that goal accomplished and how can we better do it? Or how can we just do it technically? Problems and workarounds in their current process, especially when you're working with an internal application, meaning an application that the company has built for itself, for its employees to use, and therefore enforces its employees to use it. A lot of times, employees will have clever workarounds with the system to avoid either using it or to make someone else do it or to just kind of fiddle with the system and not actually have it do what, what the business wants it to do. And then the successes and necessities of their current process. What works really well right now and what is falling down? So that way we don't imitate the failures of the current application. And also so that we remember to keep the successes too. Looks around nervously. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Good to see you here, buddy. All right. So quick ways to inject UX. So let's talk a little bit about some of the different techniques. We're going to go over these. Relatively quickly, I uh, let's see, don't have one. There we go. We're going to go through these relatively quickly, but if you have any questions, obviously type them in or ask at the end. So the first thing I like to do is a six up. This is one of the easiest things that you can do. So 
when I'm actually starting to design, I will get a whiteboard or just a blank piece of paper and I will force myself to sketch something in six different ways. It could be the layout of the screen. It could be a particular component on the screen because I'm not quite sure how I wanna do it. So what I do is I literally just take a piece of paper and draw it into six sextrants. I used to call it quadrants, but I was pointed out to me quadrants is for four. So it's called sextants, which I thought were like a ship, but it's also here too. You can mansplain it to me later, but um, brainstorming with the six up, you basically make six different iterations of what this component could look like. And it is pretty easy to do the first one, two, three. When you start to get to the fourth, fifth, you're stretching. You're really forcing yourself out of your comfort zone. And then by the sixth, you're generally combining ideas. And the idea isn't to force yourself to pick one of these six things. The idea is to get yourself off your first thought and let yourself examine the problem in a couple different ways. Now, you still might go with your first thought, but oftentimes what you're going to be doing is you're going to be going with a combination of things. And it'll let you look at the problem a little bit differently and reframe. Yes, they are a little low lo-fi. I love the little thank yous. Well, actually, yep, here we go. All right, the next thing would be to design iteratively. So designing iteratively just means that you're not going to turn anything into your golden cow. You're not going to really cling to a design because it's yours and it's amazing. This happens with all designers, no matter how long you've been in the business. Sometimes you'll make something and you'll be exceptionally proud of it. And then someone will tell you, you're, you that your baby's ugly. And sometimes, especially early in your career, it is very hard to take that, but you have to be able to kind of uncling to it and be able to design it iteratively, meaning tear things up, erase, move things around, don't get too comfortable with something until you've done some testing. Another thing I do is user interviews. In the railroad business, we call this the go and see because that's the cool thing that we like to do. Um, in a non-COVID world, that meant that I would be going through the railroad network and I would be talking to engineers, I'd be talking to yard masters, I'd be talking to uh, our people in our supply offices, I'd be talking to people in HR, et cetera, et cetera. Whichever project I was working on, I would be actually going and seeing, and I would be following them around and observing. Now what I'm doing is having little sessions that I have where they share their screen and we're just kind of talking through their jobs. So I might just watch them for an hour or so on how they do their job and just kind of ask questions and have them show me what they're doing. I'm just watching them work, I'm noting their process, and I'm having them teach me what they do. So when you talk about user interviews, we're gonna dig into this a little bit more because there's a lot here. I have, I have other talks that specifically are on this and other talks and even workshops that are on this. So we're gonna go through this really fast and feel free to ask questions later. Um, identify your biases, leave your assumptions at the door. So when I talk about identifying your biases, it's saying like, you might have the feeling that your users are a certain way. Like my users are resistant to change or my users are technologically illiterate, et cetera. But if it's just based on general knowledge, oftentimes it could be uh, deceptive or misleading. So you want to actually identify your biases. What do I already think I know? So that way I'm not trying to look for confirmation bias of saying, I expect to see this, that you wanna make sure that you have identified what you expect to see, so you know you're not particularly just looking for it. You know what you're biased against. And then you try to leave those assumptions at the door as best you can. Avoid leading questions. A leading question is basically a question where you're predisposing the user to the answer. That might be where you're giving them a, I think this is right, but what do you think sort of question? Or you might be giving them an A, B choice when they, the answer really is C. So you have to really be careful about how you speak. And this is something that you have to just learn over time and a lot, a lot of practice. I also advocate the 90-10 rule. Does anybody know what the 90-10 rule is in interviews? Spider ends are more closely related to earth elephants than earth spiders. Interesting groove coder, okay. I worry if I don't ask leading questions, the user will always find a cliff. 
All right, 90% of your info comes for 10% of your questions. Okay, that's a good guess. Um, so the 90-10 rule is you want your users to do 90% of the talking and you do 10% of the talking. So in a normal conversation, it's about a 50-50, right? Or it should be. In an interview, the interviewer should be doing very little talking. They're interested primarily in what the interviewee has to say. So we want them to do 90% of the talking. So just kind of in your head, if you realize, oh my gosh, I'm talking a lot, um, you're probably violating that 90-10 rule and you might just be impressing the user rather than getting good feedback from them, which might feel really good, but it won't give you what you need. Okay. Uh, talk about the present. So talk about what's happening now. This is a Spaceballs reference. We're in now now. And the reason why we talk about the present is because if you ask people to speculate on their future behavior, how do we speculate? We speculate on our ideal selves. I told myself at the beginning of the week, Ash, how many times are you going jogging today or this week? And I said to myself, I'm going to go jogging every single day. And I have only gone jogging three times, which is better than last week, but it's still not every single day like I predicted. And last week it was only twice, so getting better. But if you talk about the present rather than ask them to speculate, everybody generally speculates on their future ideal self. I'll give you an example. So let's say you're walking through a process and the user is getting really frustrated and you ask a leading question, or let's say not you, your business analyst friend that you brought along with you asks a question, says, well, I see you're stuck. Would you just call customer service at this point? And you just said, yeah, I think I would. I think I would call customer service at this point. Yeah, because I am stuck. So they're speculating on their future behavior. So they note that down, would call customer service. And then the UX hat goes on and says, well, let's test that theory. How many times in the past have you gotten stuck and called customer service? And their answer was zero. So oftentimes, a lot of people think, well, if they mess up, they're going to do this thing that they told me they're going to do. Oftentimes, that's not the case. They might just abandon your product. So we got to talk about the present, what's happening now. Don't ask them to speculate. If you have to, you can ask them about past behavior, but try to talk about the present. All right, so this is the master apprentice model. Basically, it's just a reminder to treat your, your subject, your uh, interviewee, as the master of their domain. They're the one who's actually going to be using your product, even though you know way more about the inner workings of the product, how everything is made, all the models, et cetera. They're the one that's going to be using it for their job, and they know the process best for their job. So it's best to treat them as the master. Now, does that mean you have to do everything they tell you to do? No, but it will let you know the inner workings, the cognitive models that they have about how the work is done, even if those cognitive models do not align with what the software is actually doing it lets you get inside their inner workings of what they think is happening. And that is very important for us to understand. All right. Okay, so we've talked about these things. One of the biggest um, and easiest things for people to do generally is just some usability testing. And that's where you give the user a prototype and some realistic tasks, note where they get stuck and note where they succeed. Once again, I've got a whole day long workshop about usability testing, but let's just sum it up in a nutshell. So in a nutshell, you wanna let them do the talking. You have the user do the talking, remain neutral, kind of like that 90-10 rule, only you're not asking questions. Do not lead the user or provide training. This is the hardest thing for people to do because if they see the user struggling, a lot of times they wanna point out, they wanna help, they wanna coach, but you have to pretend like, Basically, how would you do this if I wasn't here? And keep redirecting that because they'll continue to ask you questions. Well, should I click this or should I click that? And you have to keep redirecting to, how would you do this if I wasn't here? If you were just doing this task on your own. Have them speak their thoughts aloud. So if you're timing the study, you wouldn't have them do that because you're trying to do a, a time in motion. But if you're not timing the study and you want to get really deep on what they're looking at, what they're saying, what they're thinking, et cetera, it's best to have them speak their thoughts out loud so they can say, well, I was expecting to see some sort of registration or something, but I don't know where it is. Uh, maybe it's this button, et cetera. So you're kind of hearing them talk through their thoughts. They're, they often will say keywords that they're looking for, and those are things you can want to tune into. 
Another big thing is do not defend the design. I know you worked a lot of time on it and they might say some things that might come off as pretty offensive to you, right? But the thing is to remember that they're not trying to be offensive. They're trying to give you feedback and you're gonna be using that feedback to make the product better. They're gonna be using this product potentially every single day. Um, so please don't defend the design, just accept the feedback. You don't have to agree with it, but you collect the feedback and if it's you seeing it becoming a pattern in your usability testing, there might be something to it. You wanna find out why they struggled and why they succeeded. So generally we ask some probing questions and some follow-up questions after tasks, and then you'll improve the parts that they struggled in and make sure you try to keep the parts that they succeeded in as you continue to iterate. Now, what do you think would happen if you click on this? Um, yeah, you can ask stuff like that as well. Um, but if you do that, uh, so that is kind of asking, we'll get into the q and I I don't wanna get, get off my side tangent. All right, so usability testing is not functional testing. A lot of people confuse like, oh yeah, we've done testing, but really what they're talking about is they're talking about functional testing. And it's not a focus group where you bring a bunch of people in and you have them talk about the design all, all together. It's not working with only business partners and just having someone coronate something. It's not just asking the users what they want. A lot of people get really confused with this. They're like, wait, isn't that what we're trying to do here? Ask them what they want. Yes, but a lot of times users aren't designers. They may not even be technologists. Oftentimes they're not. So they may not even be aware of what is capable. So asking users what they want sometimes does not work out. Oftentimes it doesn't because they may not know how to voice what they want. It's also not a software demo. So if you are moving the mouse during the usability test, you're not doing a usability test. You're doing a demo. They should be the one that's controlling the application. And then it's also not expensive or hard to do. It takes a lot of practice, 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 but you can get good results and, and good positive um, changes made, even if you're not a savant in usability testing. All right, so the last thing I wanna talk about is black hat sessions. Um, these are called a lot of different things on the internet. I call them black hat sessions because that's how I was taught, uh, but they're basically having a project team critique your design using post-it notes and a discussion model. So we'll go through that real fast as well. Um, and I'm just, yeah, I need to speed up. So you'll show a screen, you'll explain a scenario. Each participant will silently write down feedback on a sticky note. And then you'll at each at time the sticky notes, you'll give those to the moderator. So basically what's happening here is you're giving everybody a sticky notepad, you're posting a, the design to the wall, and everybody's just silently writing down and pasting their feedback. Um, you'll just tell them no one say anything. We're not gonna give any feedback out loud. We're just gonna write everything down, things you like, things you don't like, et cetera. It's important that everything be completely silent because it levels the playing field. So it's not the, the person with the biggest paycheck that everybody's listening to. Everybody's listening to everyone. Um, the moderator would then read each sticky note. You control the tone. Uh, so even if something is said sarcastically, you can say it in a more exploratory way and you can be open-minded and kind of work through the design in that way. If you want more information about Black Hack Sessions, we can talk about that later. All right, so let's get to the seven sins. So the following depictions are based on true events. Names and projects have been omitted to protect the misguided. I originally wanted to call this talk um, the seven deadly sins of UX, but my coworkers thought that that was a little bit negative, and so I, I switched it around to just pit, pitfalls. So let's talk about this. Just build it, we'll find someone to use it. The we have developers and they need to do something theory. So just build it, we'll find someone to use it, looks off like this. Um, they just put something out the door, and they expect to make money, right? Do something, make money. Your problem with that is how is success measured? We don't have goalposts. What's our business goal? Why does the business want this made? What's the user goal? Why are they going to use it? What is the projected return on investment? Um, not only bad user experience, it's bad project management. So just kind of remember, even though I'm talking to you from Nebraska and we're right next to Iowa, if you don't know who will use it, don't build it. They, they won't come necessarily. So you wanna find the value first, figure out who wants it and why, 
find the business case, discover who the users are. Who am I building this for? Who is doing this type of work now if it's, it's based on a work model? Uh, is it necessary for them to even do this at all? And is there value to the work that they're doing? Identify the target users and observe them. So in this case, you want to do user research and observation to combat this pitfall. Second, if I can use it, they can use it. It's the, how can I be different from our users theory? A lot of us are guilty of this, and sometimes I fall into this too, and I have to constantly remind myself that I am not the goddess of everyone. So let's look at you and let's look at your users. You probably have an IT background. Users, maybe. You probably have a working knowledge of the system backend and how it interacts with the rest of your other systems. Users, eh. You might have specialized lingo, acronyms, et cetera. Users, maybe. You have a specific work environment that you're used to. You know it's in, an, in my case, I have an office setting, et cetera. Users, we don't know. So the important point here is you are not your users. So how do we better know our users? We talk to them, we observe them, we interview them, we build personas, we build use cases, we use ability tests. So in this case, you wanna do user research, observations, and usability tests to combat that pitfall. Next, the functionality exists, they just need more training. The nothing is broken, the users just aren't smart enough theory. Now I have heard a lot of this in my industry. They just believe that everyone needs more training. In my industry, I mean the railroad industry. Uh, so training may be needed for some, but it's not always the case. Oftentimes people try to use training and help documentation as substitutes. We'll just release a video and then they'll be able to understand how it works. Good design can walk through functionality. It can help when needed and help them recover from errors. Remember that learnability, that memorability, that safety? That's what we're talking about here. So if multiple users are having the same issue, generally it's the design that needs revision, not the users. So ask yourself, is this a design issue or a training issue? If multiple users are reporting the issue, probably design. If it's a training issue, maybe just, maybe it's just Bill, okay? Users are clicking, running, or interacting with something accidentally over and over. Oop, why did I keep clicking that? Um, requests to the dev team are made to undo or reverse actions that, that, that happened. Uh, the user made by mistake. Hey, can you go back in the database uh, that was saved yesterday and, and revert to it? Training issue, issue subsides after training and help documentation. Uh, design issue, issue crops up again after the user has not used the system for a while, such as vacations or holidays. That's the low memorability. Um, training issue could just be only brand new users experience the user and the, the issue and the issue does not reoccur. So just to go and fix this, do a six up, iterate on that design, usability test it, correct things, iterate some more and do a black hat session. Four, I haven't heard any bad feedback, so must be good. The they'll let us know if it's wrong theory. So a lot of people come at me when I'm saying, hey, I think, I think we need to work on this. They'll say, well, we haven't heard anything. Well, there needs to be a mechanism for feedback. A lot of people will complain readily, but they won't seek you out, seek you out. So they might turn to their coworker, they might turn to their friend and complain about this application, but they might not seek you out and ask you to fix it. Other users may just blame themselves saying, well, it's my fault. I keep pressing the wrong button. I don't know why I keep doing that. They'll make excuses for themselves and they don't wanna look dumb. Uh, they might also fear offending the IT department who controls their computers. And they might just wanna be a good team player. That's especially for internal applications. One of the things I always remember my, with myself is feedback is a gift, treat it that way. They care enough to give you feedback, that's awesome. It's not necessarily true on Twitter, but generally it is true in person. How to get good feedback. So you wanna check in with your users. Surveys are sometimes helpful. Um, you have to really be careful how you put together a survey because you can really make it biased and just juicing the numbers quite easily. Um, observations, observe them in their workplace. That's always very helpful. Try not to get attached to your design as we talked earlier. Listen openly and don't jump to the defense. And if you actually go and see and you see little notes like this, like paste it all over their monitors, that generally means something's wrong. They, they constantly need reminders to do things. There might be a usability issue. So user research, observations, usability testing. 
the I know what they need. Whoa. Come on. I know what they need. Do this or the my experience trumps user research theory. So this happens a lot with subject matter experts and subject matter experts are awesome. Oftentimes I've worked with some great ones about what they do, but a lot of times they aren't the actual users and they might have outdated information, meaning they may have done this job or this role in the past, but they don't do it any longer and they used to do it a different way. Oftentimes, if you have a user group of one, you are in fact coronating that user. This is the ideal user. We will do what Jamie says, right? Um, oftentimes it could be the highest ranking person or the person with the biggest paycheck. And a lot of times these folks are really time crunched. So you might not even get a lot of time with them. So that's why I say strive for five. You're looking for five representative users in each user group. So when I say user group, it basically means the type of users that do this thing. So I might have my yard masters, they do a very different thing than my engineers, but they might be using the same application. I would need five of each. So you wanna get first-hand information and collaborate. User observations and usability testing is excellent for this. Um, utilize subject matter experts to identify business goals, help find users and collaborate on solutions. They are great with solution collaboration and just bouncing things off wall. I, that's what I use them the most for, especially if I can't get a user. Um, they often have old contacts that they can reach into and say, oh, go talk to these people. They still that, do that job. And so that's excellent. So usability test, do those black hat sessions, get out there. Number six, I don't know what they want, so just ask them. The, the customer is always right theory. And this is an easy one to fall into because you can just say, well, you, they told me to do it, so we did it. Um, this is a good thought, but we have to be aware. Users are not designers, as I said. They don't know what options they have. They don't know the tech. They don't have necessarily the full picture. And they might be too close to the process. I use the Henry Ford quote. If I asked my customers what they want, they would just say a faster horse. Now, in the Henry Ford quote, he's using it to say completely disregard the users. But what I'm saying is look at the why behind the suggestion. It may not be a radio button that they need. They may need a revised process. This radio button doesn't even make sense. All right, so what do you do? Well, don't take the request at face value. Keep digging. What are they trying to accomplish with this request? What issue are they currently having? What is the pain behind the suggestion? That's really what you're looking into. So you can use six up observations, really dig in. And the final is let's just get it out there and fix the usability stuff later. It's UX is window dressing theory. Now I hear this a lot. We don't need to worry about the UX right now. That makes things extremely difficult. So for externally facing customers, the cost can be higher than with internally facing customers. You've got damage to brand reputation. You could have poor articles, poor reviews, poor word of mouth, loss of trust, lost in sale. I mean, I'm sure we've all given at least one of these. If I could give it zero stars, I would. You only get one shot at a first impression. And not only that, Oftentimes, if you wait till later to do the UX and you realize, oh, we have to completely redesign the process, it's too expensive to do. So you ended up just putting Band-Aids all over the place to make it slightly better. And that's just not cost effective for anyone. So the earlier you inject UX, the better the results. I like to use this. This is from Roger Pressman Software Engineering, a practitioner's approach by McGraw-Hill. So the cost of changing something during design where you're, you know, pen and paper or in Azure RP or you're in Balsamic uh, versus during coding versus once live. So you're basically burning money each time you go up. I like to think of it as if I'm building a house, I'm going to be changing things while I'm on making that blueprint, right? I'm not going to be changing things once I've already poured the, co the concrete foundation and started putting studs up and then decide, no, let's just start over and just whip it out. It's just too expensive. So usability benefits improve user satisfaction, increase user productivity, decrease user errors because of that safety, reduce training costs they're not calling in, um, reduce development costs because you're not climbing the same hill over and over, and reduced user support costs. So those are my six ways to, um, those are my seven pitfalls and my quick ways to inject UX. 
What questions do you have? Kind of buzz through at the end there. A lot of us developers are not in the position to implement these excellent uh, questions. I'll let you do this, Max. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll moderate this. Um, I'll stop. If you, wanna, yeah. if you wanna stop sharing your screen. Absolutely. And then again, if anyone has any extra questions, uh, be sure to at me on Twitch or uh, Slack and we'll get them in to Ash. Okay, uh, out the gate, this is, I feel like this is a question I ask at the beginning of every talk. Will these slides be available? Yes, um, you can either reach out to me on LinkedIn, reach out to me on Twitter. I'll just send you to my Dropbox. But yep, absolutely. Um, okay, so this comes from Groove Coder. Uh, with respect to user goals, business goals, and technical feasibility, what are the pits people fall into while trying to harmonize all these together? So a lot of times the, while well, harmonizing these together, so a lot of times people don't know how to necessarily balance things properly. So they'll do whatever is easiest to change. Um, they'll say, well, I don't think we have time to do interviews. I don't think we have time to do this or that. And that's oftentimes the pit they're falling into. They're, they're misunderstanding how much time doing research actually saves you on the backside when you're actually doing that development. So they see it as, oh, this is this activity that we have to do prior, and all it does is cost us money. But really, it's going to shorten that development later on because you don't have to fix it. So that's the number one pitfall I see when trying to harmonize is, is just saying, well, you know, you're using the orchestra, you know, just, just getting rid of the whole brass section because they're not needed. It's They just decided that it's, it's just not needed, um, and they'll just focus on something else entirely. So that's kind of what I see there. Um, I have rarely ever seen someone overdo it on UX where they put too much UX. I know it happens. It does not happen in my organization where they say, oh man, we, we really want to front load. So I, I generally don't worry about cautioning people about doing too much research. But if you are afraid they're going to be doing too much research, generally what I say is um, when you start hearing the same things over and over again, then you know you're you've basically done enough because now everything's starting to repeat themselves. So you don't need to do 50 users. You can generally stop at five because that's when things will stop repeating themselves and you'll have a good sample. What else? Gotcha. Uh, okay, this one's from Cassidy. Uh, how do you incentivize users to come to focus groups and do usability testing? Well, this depends on external versus uh, internal. So if you're focusing on internal employees a lot of times it's pretty easy uh, to incentivize them because you know you talk to their boss etc and you, you get in there um sometimes you can bring swag so we have a certain amount of like you know like a up hat or a coffee mug or whatever with external customers it's actually a mixed bag it really depends uh we specifically look at our analytics mm -hmm. for our customers to see um particularly who um, is, is a high use customer, who is low use, like, and we just pick our, generally our most engaged and then a couple sample sizes from, and our most engaged, we generally don't have to incentivize them at all because we're using that analytics. They're actually really invested in our products. And the way we pitch it to them is saying, we are trying to make the products better for you. We're giving you the opportunity to have a hand in how we change this design. And a lot of times, especially with our legacy products that were built in the 90s, maybe, they are so excited for us to be changing them and for the better that they really want the opportunity to give us that. I would say other companies do use some incentives. You can give out gift cards and things like that. You do have to worry about some users just do things for the gift cards, especially if you're doing like a generic sample. So, you know, I just, I'm going to make an application for, a dating application, for example. It's like, I'm gonna make the next Tinder. Um, a lot of people will do it for the incentive and they'll just kind of give you whatever data. So I, I often say, try to make sure your users have some skin in the game. And oftentimes I use that with analytics data and seeing uh, if what products they're currently using and trying to, to go from there. And that's how I identify who I'm gonna start targeting. I will say, don't just do the top users because they're gonna be different minded than people that use it left awesome. You wanna 
reach out, but I reach out, you know, if I reach out to 30 people, I'm probably going to get five people back. So keep, you have to just reach out to a lot and realize that you're probably only get like those five. I'll schedule eight and generally five will show up. So stuff like that. Did that answer your question? Look here. Yeah, it did. Um, okay. Uh, let's, a lot of us developers are not in a position to implement these practices. Do you have any recommendations on how to, as a lowly developer, encourage or demonstrate the benefits of proper UI UX research? Yeah. So this is something I get a lot, especially from my developers. And honestly, I think developers are kind of one of the most powerful pieces because at the end of the day, you're the ones that are writing the code. And if you tell your boss like, no, no, that can't be done. A lot of times they might just believe you. Uh, <laughs> so I, I actually, I work very closely with my developers to try to get them to, to do research activities with me to really understand the impacts of UX. But if you're saying we don't have anyone in UX, it's, it's just me, it's just me and maybe like my project manager, it's just me and, and my business analyst. How do we use any of these UX activities? Um, really depends on your political culture for your organization. I tend to be an ask forgiveness, not permission type of gal. Obviously I wouldn't do that with anything proprietary, but I will just, if I wanna do a go and see, I'll just go do a go and see. Um, if I wanna perform some usability tests, I will just perform usability tests. Now, if you need permission to talk to external users and you cannot get that permission and they refuse to give you that permission, okay, the next best thing that you can do is try to find other people in your organization that are somewhat similar to the users and test on them, okay? A lot of times I use customer service representatives. So those are people that are hearing your customer complaints. They kind of have a good idea of the personalities of your customer. And so I reach out to them first if I can't get I really can't get access to those users and they can give you pretty good knowledge. Is it as good as getting it straight from the horse's mouth? No, but it's a lot better than nothing. So I would say those are different avenues that you can work around and, and just kind of do some research yourself, especially within the company. Schedule a meeting. Um, this kind of piggybacks on that. And that's, uh, what are your thoughts on consulting with developers before designing? Do you just design or keep them in mind on how the back end oh, works? Oh gosh, no. Of it. <laughs> so um, I so when I do my first my initial design, I will kind of do pie in the sky. Now I'm talking, I'm just like sketching on my I'm just sketching and sketching. And then I will go talk to my developers and say, here are these ideas that I'm having. What's feasible? <laughs> what can we do with the software? And at this point, I kind of know what we can do. Um, but sometimes if I want to do something a little bit kooky, the first person I'm going to talk to is my developer, because I'm not going to sell a project manager or a business stakeholder on something that that is going to completely screw over my developer. So yes, so designers looking out there, making something beautiful, it's really good to talk with your developers. And I've made a lot of friends with developers in my company. So um, I know the ones that are super, super good. And so oftentimes if I get an answer from my developer, like, no, we can't do that. I will go double check with my other, like some architects, like, is this really true? Is this cannot be done? How hard is this? So I will check on you, make sure we're building like that trust up, trust, but verify. Um, but yes, you absolutely need to talk to your developers. Otherwise you're gonna design something that can't be made. Gotcha. Uh, okay. Um... We only have time for a couple more. I might have to pick some some winners and losers here. Uh, how big of a project do you think is needed to use UX? Uh, example, a small website project with my friends, does that need UX? So kind of a scoping question there. Right, so I think every project does need some UX, but the question is how much, okay? So what I look at is impact and number of users. So. I'm um, just kind of looking at this quadric. If something has a high impact, but low users, because you're in high impact, I would still use quite a bit of user experience techniques. If it is low impact and low users, like it's an admin screen that maybe three people in your company will see, okay, yeah, I, I, you know, you don't really need to do a lot of UX practices with that. Um, if you have high impact, high users or low impact, high users, I would also use UX for that. Obviously the high impact, high users, you wanna 
put the most UX scale to it. That being yep. said, there's a lot of really easy UX stuff that you can do, especially iterative design and talking to your stakeholders. So you can at least do that with almost every project. All right, I think we're out of time. We've still got some outstanding questions. Are you on the Techlahoma Slack channel? I am, I will, I can respond right. to those. Okay. Sure. I'll, I'll port them over. Um, anyone, I think they all came from Twitch. So uh, I'll, I'll give a, another direction round up for how to get from Twitch to Slack, but cool. Uh, right. We can't thank you enough. That was a fantastic talk. Um, and we're looking forward to keeping the dialogue going over on Slack. So thank I think you. So it was great. Thank you so much for your time, Ash.